So we want to thank you all so much for coming tonight on this historic Chicago night. And we, of course, don't mind at all if you keep us updated on important plays or scores. <laughs> um, and we also want to thank the Chicago Humanities Festival for having us here, uh, and uh, as well as the museum. And um, so first, of course, you're probably guessing that Jason Hamill, who is uh, over here to our far here. I'm curious, how many people have been to Lula Cafe? So you all, not bad. so yeah, <laughs> pretty you. good, pretty good majority. <laughs> How many people uh, have uh, know of Scratch Beer? Have had Scratch Beer? Oh, lucky, lucky, very elusive beer. How many people have been down to the brewery? Yes, I know, dreams. So let's start with Jason. Um, so let's start actually with the concept of slow food. You know, we've kind of touched a little bit about the general concept, but it's actually the organization which you know you have some familiarity with, having been a pioneer in the movement. Uh, and I've been a member of Slow Food as well. Uh, I mean, uh, as everyone knows, it's a or may know, it's a organization that was developed out of a um, the time when McDonald's showed up at the. Uh, Piazza di Spagna in uh, Rome, and there was a protest movement against the McDonald's there. But you know, it's it has grown into uh, to signify something much broader and um, and deeper. I've been a delegate at the Slow Food con Convention in uh, in Torino um, a, a while ago, and then just a practicer, and like both as a restaurant owner and a chef, and as a person, a parent, whatever, um, <laughs> in all ways. Mm -hmm. And um, Marika, so we were having this discussion earlier, it's Marika Stevenson. <laughs> so I, I, mean, I, I don't know why exactly. <laughs> so know. how do you it's say your name correctly? <laughs> Marika <laughs> Josephson. Marika Josephson, yes. which all day I've been worried about. <laughs> so um, boy, uh, so you are at Scratch Brewery. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about your slow drink down there mm -hmm. and your, your planting crops that are eventually going to be beer, maybe. Right. Tell us a little bit about Scratch. Yeah, we are a little tiny farmhouse brewery um, in southern Illinois. We're about five hours south of Chicago here. We're on a little system, a little two-barrel system, which I don't even think would be possible in Chicago. I think the smallest system is probably 10 or 15 barrels, which is barely getting by. But um, it allows us to experiment a lot with different plants and things. So. We make beer with locally farmed and foraged ingredients um, that are kind of regionally specific. We pretty much try to gather as much as we possibly can from our property in the woods around us. Um, we're on five acres. Uh, we have a really big garden. Um, pretty much everything that goes on our food menu comes from our garden um, or otherwise comes from local producers. Um, and we use that stuff in our beer too and we run into the woods around the brewery and gather things to put into the beer also. Yeah, like um, bark and mushrooms, literally. And the, the funniest, one of the funniest things is that um, on your website it says Outside Magazine named you one of the top four foraged beers in the United States. I was like, I, who are the other ones? I mean, so what's the deal with foraged beers? Yeah, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty neat. There's a little contingent of people uh, out around the country that are um, trying to source their ingredients locally in, in some shape or form. Um, and uh, I guess with the kind of foraged food craze, um, anybody who's doing it in beer too is kind of on that same wave. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, I mean, I think for all of us, um, we're all trying to create something that really has a sense of place um, and for us specifically at our brewery, I think we're trying to kind of revive some plants that um, may have been a part of our diet at one point in time and, and aren't anymore. Um, it's pretty neat. We have locals that come into the brewery um, who try a beer that we've made and they, it reminds them of something that their grandmother used to make um, and they would smell cooking or just a walk through the woods. There's, we have lots of hunters in our area. and. Yep. I mean, they're out in the woods all the time, and they're they're experiencing these smells and um, even flavors and stuff. And you know, they connect with it as much as as anybody else does too. Well, I, I I'm dying to try some of them. So I just wanted to also mention too that we are going to plan on talking amongst ourselves here for about until about 45 or so, and then we'll take uh, do Q and A in the last 15 minutes or so. Um, 
So I always think it's a good, it helps to get an idea if, you know, we haven't had a chance to go to Lula or had scratch beer recently to get an idea of like from food and drink. I have an idea of what I think a signature dish is at mm -hmm. Lula. I know you change, you know, with the seasons, with everything. What do you think is a signature seasonal dish? I, I mean, uh, honestly, we don't really ha have them because we, we change the menu constantly. We do have like a, a cafe menu that runs all day that's more casual. And um, you know there are, there are all sorts of dishes on that, but the the menu that we focus on is uh, every Monday night we put three new dishes up. We've been doing it for uh, 17 years now, so there's thousands of new, new experiments that we try each week. And uh, and then the brunch menu you mentioned the Royale. I mean that just constantly changes as well. Okay, wait, um, no, know. don't gloss over that one because okay. that's to me that's kind of like oops, sorry. It's a big deal. For yeah. You. So the Royale. So tell us about the Royale. Well, and it's just what big, it is right now. It's Let's just a big sloppy uh, breakfast sandwich. Um, what no, it is right you're now, underselling it, yeah. Um, right now it's uh, a smoked pork loin and it has kale and induya, which is a Calabrian <laughs> um, sausage. We actually make a vinaigrette with the andouille, so there's not a lot of like sausage on the dish, but it's a flavor. So we, something that we do a lot of is to use proteins to season vegetables. So we're not, you know, super protein centric of a restaurant. You're not going to get tons of uh, big chops and, you know, uh, pieces of meat. But we we'll, we'll use proteins to flavor and season seasonal vegetables. Um, so that's what it is right now, and we're working on some new ones, thinking it through. So yeah, I I have to say that one of my most memorable Royale sandwiches was. Um, a soft shell crab and I think it's funny so like the history of it is that it's always been on the menu from the beginning yeah, I mean, we've always had a yeah okay. had this crazy sandwich and it does change seasonally and basically if you put it out onto a platter or a plate or even courses that in and of itself would be like this beautiful multi-course farm-to-table meal but you mm -hmm. put it together in a sandwich yeah I mean, the sandwich that I was talking about has butternut squash mustarda on it, which is like something that you don't see every day. So we take, we shave butternut squash raw really thin and then hot pickle it with a lot of mustard and it's a pretty sweet pickle. And then we layer that into the kale. So, I mean, that's hmm. kind of a, you know, a little more hoity preparation <laughs> <laughs> uh, for a breakfast sandwich. Right. But, uh, you know, the soft shell crabs, I mean, it's seasonal, but we change it constantly. Like, we don't see seasons as... In, you know, the year is not in quarters for us. It's in much different, uh, you know, chunks of time. And also seasons don't necessarily come and go as you expect, you know. Right. Um, like tonight. Like this yeah, yeah, like right exactly. now. Exactly, yeah. I mean, honestly, like there were tomatoes at the market yeah. last Saturday from right. a leaning shed farm. And um, we did a dish with like late season tomatoes and, um, we, you know, in October. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I mean, you know, go global warming, but you don't know what's going to happen <laughs> in the choking. future either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I know. Uh, right now is a, is a great time. I mean, it seems like it's a waning time for seasonal food, but um, after first frost, you get a lot of really great greens, mm -hmm. which is why we're serving kale on the sandwich. But the greens really sort of enliven and get really sweet at this time of year. So it's a good time to eat your green vegetables. Yeah. <laughs> I, so yeah, definitely. I have to say, as a fan, a big fan favorite. Um, and uh, uh, at Scratch Beer, um, you're known for, like I said, I'm not kidding. Like the the tree bark and mushroom, like you just had, or is it coming up? The black mushroom beer. We just had that one on. Okay. Uh, what is that all about? What's that taste like? So we uh, we've had about four bottle offerings since May. Um, two of them have been mushroom beers. Uh, the, our very first bottle release was a chanterelle mushroom uh, beer de garde, a French farmhouse style beer. Chanterelles are kind of apricotty and buttery, and kind of you know. The, so the beer has this. The beer is it's a beer meant for keeping, so it, it's usually cellared and sometimes has a kind of I don't know uh, oxidized cellared quality. Sometimes people think of it as almost like the smell of a cork or something. And so that beer with the mush the mushrooms kind of you know, enhanced or complemented that flavor. And the black trumpet is related to a chanterelle. It looks like it, but it's a little bit smaller. It's brown and it's really chocolatey. So that beer was kind of similar to the chanterelle, but a little bit more malty and darker, 
a little bit of chocolate malt was in there, but almost all the amazing chocolate aroma and flavor that came out of that beer was from the mushrooms. Where did these mushrooms come from? They come from our property. Um, we are, so we're on a little five acre plot that's kind of cleared and we've got um, our, our small little garden farm there. Um, and then just behind us, we've got about 75 acres of my partner Aaron's family's land right. um, to basically run through and, and play around in and pick stuff. So you were able to, when did you get the, when did you brew the Black Trumpet beer? The Black Trumpet beer, so we harvested those last year um, and we, we dehydrated them. them. Yeah. yeah, and with the chanterelles, we actually used them, not fresh, but we froze them fresh. Um, and then we boiled them, and they still had a lot of flavor and aroma. Um, but the black trumpets, we actually found that dehydrating them really concentrates the chocolate flavor more. Yeah, so, like, we have black trumpets on the menu right now, and mm. one of my favorite ways of cooking black... It's okay that we're just talking like yeah, this. Yeah, please. <laughs> um, but that was good. All right. Um, the, one of the best ways of cooking black trumpets is to start them in a dry pan. And if you, if you take, you know, a quarter or two of black trumpet mushrooms, fresh ones, and put them in a pan without any fat, no butter, no olive oil, anything, um, and heat them up, you'll see in just a minute or two, you know, maybe, you know, uh, a quarter or a more third of their weight in water suddenly appear. Mm -hmm. And I like to cook the water out and dry them in the pan and then introduce the fat in later stages. Oh, cool. Um, so it's kind of so, you know, similar. Yeah. They really concentrate their it flavor does. as they pull right. moisture out of them, Yeah. Uh, which is cool. Were, they, uh, were these ones fresh harvested? Yeah. From some, yeah. yeah, we're kind of getting like a second black trumpet season now at the end right. of the fall. Yeah, that's cool. If you have any extra, let me know. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say that um, uh, Jason and Marka um, and have known each other for years and friends because only friends would ask each other, where do you forage your mushrooms? <laughs> that's like one of those faux pas questions <laughs> or like, not, not faux pas, but like, you know, for unless if you ask anybody, they'd be like, I'm why? Tell you. Who, who you ask? Yeah, yeah. Why you ask? <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. So it's a testament to your um, friendship. I, mean, I, don't, I don't think a lot, of, a lot of people don't know that there are mushrooms you can farm and mushrooms that you can't farm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and the ones we're talking about are ones that you can't, you know, they are, they're not capable to be grown somewhere by somebody mm -hmm. on purpose. So mm -hmm. uh, you have to look for them or to know where to go. Know someone to ask to get right. them for you. Mm -hmm. And their French name is, um, translates to uh, trumpets of death because they look a lot like <laughs> mushrooms that you should not be eating. So, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but that is really pretty amazing. And, and so, um, so one of the things I was asking Jason earlier was um, uh, if you had uh, scratch beer at Lula uh, because it's so elusive. So where can we, wouldn't it be great to have that trumpet mushroom dish and yeah, work on that. the beer yeah, together, on yeah. That. So um, so now that we know that we can possibly get some of these mushroom dishes at Lula, um, wh where and when can we try some of the scratch beer? We do make uh, infrequent runs up to Chicago and just dump a bunch of beer off. Um, so uh, the Beer Temple and Westlake View Wickers are gonna kind of our two bottle shops in town and then uh, we have draft at the local option and uh, Maria's in Bridgeport. Those are our those are our normal stops. Yeah, those are pretty beer beer geek beer geeky places. Yeah, geeky places. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and very small uh, uh, amounts. Small I mean, quantities. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Quanti there you go. Mm -hmm. Quantities and that right now you're reserving a uh, black blackberry and lavender and lavender. Yeah. And so what's the flavor of that like and and, and why, because yeah. it seems kind of actually a little bit counterintuitive to have something like that this time of the year. Yeah, um, well we brewed that one in the, in the summer. Um, it's been conditioning in the bottle since then. Um, so it, it is, I guess, kind of counterintuitive to release it now, but I guess kind of with, with the seasonality of things with beer, you kind of, if you're really brewing with the seasons truly and you get something in um, to brew with that was just picked out of the ground or off a tree or whatever, um, it kind of, it ends up being available almost past the season in a way. I mean, most of the pumpkin beers that you see on the shelves, you know, they are out in August when no pumpkin has um, popped up in any garden anywhere. Um, because, you know, they usually get, either there's no pumpkin in it at all, it's just spices, or they're using something from the, the season before or possibly something that was pasteurized and prepackaged. But um, 
for us, we like to use as much as we can, just fresh out of our garden. So if we were to do a pumpkin beer, it would probably not be available until sometime in the winter. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, the, the blackberry lavender beer um, is part of a, a series of beers that we did with just botanical ingredients, uh, no hops. Um, tastes really different from beers that you might be used to drinking. Um, not necessarily all that bitter, have a really different kind of bitterness because they use different plants. Mm -hmm. um, and this one in particular, we fermented with um, our, our sourdough bread culture, actually, which we uh, ferment about 90% of our beers with. Um, we've kind of found that we can control it in certain ways, so sometimes we kind of encourage the sourness to come out, which we did with this beer. So this is a, a sour beer with blackberries, and then the lavender in the boil ends up kind of being cinnamon or almost cherry-like. It's really interesting and it just complements the blackberry. This is more legit slow food than anything, like <laughs> that. anything that I do. No. Well, it's funny. What I see kind of with the parallels between you both is that though you're both very rooted in uh, uh, tradition and uh, you know certainly local seasonal ingredients, again, being pioneers, um, what I've seen especially through Lula's evolution over the years is that you're now, you know, your plating alone is uh, incredibly modern and elegant. I mean, very minimalist. Mm -hmm. I mean, even the space, you know, we've talked about this before, um, it's amazing to go in and, uh, and see that you've kept the patina of so many of the former spaces. I mean, literally, you know, everything from the exterior signage inside, uh, but you've got little modern touches. I mean, and so since you're not working, since you're not doing like just sort of basic, uh, you know, farm to table menus and food, you're really being very creative about it. I mean, how, how has that changed? I mean, some of the stuff that you're doing now, like, like you're saying, like the, um, like the butternut squash mustarda, really taking that to the next level. It's kind of like, you guys are like, you know, we've done a lot of the basic canning <laughs> and all those sorts of flavors and ingredients now, and you're taking it to a more modern level. Can you talk a little bit about like, was that a, um, has, that, has that been a real conscious choice in more recent years, or has that really been like your in, intent from the beginning was really making it modern? I, I mean, I'm not sure. I, like, I think that part of the pleasure of being a cook is to do things that, you know, for the first time. I mean, that's true for home cooks as, as much as uh, for professional cooks. Um, and I, this, you know, the, by the first time, I mean like to have an idea that you haven't done before or something that you feel like expressing that makes sense in some sort of like, um, you know, more like a metaphysical way, like mm -hmm. outside of your like common understanding of, um, of what works with what. Um, so, you know, when we come up with a new dish, it's always new um, to us and to our guests and to the cooks that are making it. And that's one of the things that's exciting. Um, so, I, you know, I think that creatively, it's always kind of been like that. I mean, even uh, the changes have been that we've grown older. And I, when I started, I was 27 and had no idea what I was doing at all. And um, one of the things that you have when you're 27 is like you're a little more cocky than you might, <laughs> maybe you should be. Um, so, you know, we just went for it at the time. And now, you know, knowing what I know, you know, I'm sort of uh, look back and be like, wow, you really didn't know what you were doing. <laughs> um, but it's that sense of like doing something even though you don't know what you're doing and like mm -hmm. giving it a shot and working with something that I feel like is what I want to continue to express and what I encourage in all the younger chefs that I work with. Um, and likewise, I feel like there's a connection to seasonality there that's important. Like, we don't, I don't see our, like, farm to table is like a, not a term that I go around, like, you know, writing on a piece of paper and putting on my back, or, I, you know, we don't necessarily list farms on the menu and, like, trumpet the fact that we do support so much local agriculture because that's just part of what we do. Um, but the fact is that I go to the market myself, you know, twice a week. Uh, we buy from a lot, a lot from a lot of people. And when you're a cook at Lula, you see all this stuff coming in and it's for real. And when you have to re respond to the changes in the product, that's when um, the sort of like open creative, like, oh, I don't know what to expect and like I'm still going to make it work, starts to connect to seasonality. 
like you know, cooking times and temperatures, like touching stuff, like that's the that is the interaction that I want the cooks to have. And I always, mm -hmm. I'm always telling them like you're not here to heat stuff up and put it on plates. You're not here to like make it look pretty. I mean, that's nice that you do make it look pretty, and mm -hmm. you, that's a requirement, but. You're here to interact with the food, and if it's not done in two minutes and it's going to take three, then you need to take the three and recognize that that's how long it's taking because this particular squash is like more dense because, you know, whatever, nature made it that way, mm -hmm. and you have to respond to that. And I, I think that that is, um, I don't know, like it, it's, I'm not going to keep trying to bring it back to slow food because that is what I feel like the the ethos of slow food is about is like really connecting with food and making a community around food and that's what my cooks at Lula are, their community around being cooks. Um, and so that only comes when you're really interacting with food and responding to it's like, you know, caprice, like just like it's, it's not the same every time. Yeah. But I'm gonna here's, oh, oh no, no, I was going to say I'm going to second that for beer too and for what we're doing. I mean, even with, we made uh, a few basil uh, beers this year with the basil in our garden. And the first couple that we made were so bright and fresh and sweet. And the last one that we did, which we were hoping to be our, a bottled version of it, was, it was kind of just, you know, it was like end of season basil. It was a little bit more bitter and almost tannic, I want to say. And it just didn't have the same flavor we were hoping for. So we had to kind of jump in and make some adjustments and stuff so that it wasn't overly kind of bitter on your tongue and, and stuff mm -hmm. more kind of try to enhance the sweetness in other ways but it's exactly the same way mm -hmm. with beer um, when you're interacting with a real product that's really coming out of the ground during the season like you're you have to adjust all the time and improvise and be creative right it's so like slowing down is connecting not so much the speed of I mean, Lula's like a super busy restaurant, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? No one's going slowly. So right. Like, <laughs> uh, right. That's right. So, uh, you know, that said, it's like, hurry up and pay attention. But mm -hmm. the paying attention mm -hmm. is more important than anything else. Like actually being present and interacting. And it's, it's as true as for me personally as it is for the, you know, the newest cook on the team. Um, you know, I have a tendency to walk through the kitchen really quickly and like make a bunch of pronouncements and walk out and like that's not cool. Uh, I should stop and like look the people in the eye and like interact with them for a little bit less. That's my own personal goal as much as it is the, you know, the young cook on Garmage who needs to like mm -hmm. actually make the salad correctly, even mm -hmm. though it seems like it's just greens and vinaigrette, you know. But, it, but here's the thing that I think is really interesting about the departure between the original slow food uh, roots in Italy and you know what it's become and especially really so expressed with both of your work which is so creative like people don't make basil beer in italy okay and people are not doing the kind of creative stuff that you're doing with butternut squash in italy they i think that uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of traditionalists would, would have been perfectly fine with you making like really great butternut squash soup mm -hmm. for lots of many years and perfecting that and maybe changing some toppings. I mean, and we don't have the shackles of thousands of years of yes. perfect culinary <laughs> tradition to like deal with. Is that shackles? You yeah, know? I mean, that's what, so. you know, I mean, that's what Massimo Bottura would say, but mm -hmm. like... Um, Famous, creative yeah, Italian chef. Yeah, but I, I agree with you that I don't, you know, it breaks my heart since I'm like mostly Italian that... Um, that's does it not, break your heart? It does kind of. Oh. <laughs> Just because I would love to like get online and be like, oh, let me see what the, the coolest Italian, young Italian chefs are doing. And there's like three or four that I can think of that I think are really awesome. But I mean, I'm sure there are more out there, but they're really, you know, stifled by the tradition there. Unlike Copenhagen or Paris or, um, Not I mean, necessarily there, are, Paris. there are some other, other <laughs> cities, Barcelona, you know, where yeah. it's a, the, the tradition isn't as oppressive. But, oh, see, this is, yeah, but the thing, okay, so, and Massimo's not young, you know, I mean, no, he's not a he's young not. man, but uh, I think that what you are doing is you are doing that here, you know, I mean, I, I think that that's what, it's so fascinating is that while you're maintaining those really slow food traditions, that you are taking it to um, plating in flavors that would be just as much at home at the, the really modernist restaurants in Copenhagen, you know, I mm -hmm. mean, so I think that's fascinating, and that's where I'm wondering, like, uh, the the why like why aren't you doing just traditional Italian inspired American food why aren't you doing 
more classic flavors of beer. I mean, there's long traditions of both of those here too. And I'm sure it'd be a lot easier. Just wondering, you know, I mean. <laughs> well, for, for us, for, for us, for sure, um, we wanted to create a beer also that had a real sense of place. And for us, the way that we felt was the best way to go about it was to use ingredients that we were sourcing from our place. Um, and I was very lucky to, to meet Aaron, my business partner, um, who spent his life growing up in the woods and he knew every single plant that was out there. Um, and he, he taught me so much because I didn't grow up in, in Southern Illinois. So, I mean, for me, it's been a, a really big learning experience just starting the brewery and, and playing around with these different plants. Um, but for, you know, with beer, a lot of times um, people are, I mean, even craft breweries around the country, they're, they're ordering their ingredients from, not from their place. Um, so, in a, in a lot of, a lot of times, you know, beer has a tendency to be very similar, even when people are experimenting with, say, new hops or, or stuff like that. I mean, in the end, most people are getting those from uh, the same place, and it's not coming from their place. Mm -hmm. um, and, and part of the reason is that the agriculture has been lost in parts, uh, you know, around the country. Um, sometimes for good reason. I mean, barley does grow better in, in the north, uh, you know, North, South Dakota, Minnesota. Um, and, you know, you get a different product certainly when you travel farther south. Um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, so we're, we're definitely interested in kind of helping to revive um, you know, local agriculture too, in addition to using these plants that are um, a little bit out of the ordinary, but very, very indicative and representative of where we're from. Mm -hmm. You want, why are we not making traditional Italian food? Yeah, I mean, I'm uh, sure we'd love it. And trust me, no, I, mean, I don't happy, I don't know. I mean, um, I, you know, I, I mean, I've thought about it sometimes, um, and yeah. it comes up at times when we're making dishes. Um, but so I let's. I mean, an example would be prosciutto and melon, right? So um, I have a funny story about that. But the um, the the truth is that melons in Chicago, and you know, I'm. Where if there are any melon growers here, I'm sorry. And I have, <laughs> honestly have a couple of really good friends that make really nice melons, but there isn't anything like the melon that I've had. Like I lived in Italy for a year and uh, I've been back several times, been fortunate. Um, there isn't anything like melon that you would get in Tuscany um, that I had in you know, 1993 that was like life-changingly good. Um, but, uh, <laughs> My funny story is that one, I was in um, Luca with my daughter and uh, we ordered, she likes prosciutto and you know, she's lucky, she's the daughter of a chef so she gets to eat prosciutto kind of regularly because I can buy it uh, in wholesale prices. Um, and uh, so she's like, I'm like, oh, you should order this prosciutto, you know, it's, uh, it's served with melon. And she's like, ah, I don't know, melon and prosciutto sounds weird. And I'm like, no, no, you should try it. And uh, so it comes out, she grabs a piece of prosciutto, puts it in her mouth, and it's like, yeah, it's good. I'm like, no, no, you gotta taste it together. Like, that's the whole point. And she like, put it in her mouth, and this like, like look of like transformative ecstasy comes over her, and she's like, she's like, dad, you are such a good chef. I can't believe you came up with this combination. <laughs> Biggest laugh of the night is, um, so uh, that that is like, but that actually talks speaks to me about why we would not do traditional food because traditional food is born from a place and a history and a culture that like I don't, I mean I have access to it. My grandparents are from Naples, but I don't have like I'm not sitting on top of it and I don't have the melon, and you know and the prosciutto would be imported and it's, you know something is lost just in the in the translation, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of imports, um, uh, one of the things I did want to touch on too was um, going back to the Royal Sandwich, which like I said, I uh, love and, um, and is really like a three course meal in a sandwich. It's not an inexpensive sandwich, um, usually, so, um, but, um, but it is worth it. 
So to the critics for people who say, because I know that one of the big criticisms about slow food is like, oh, well, it's fine if you have like the time and the money to do it, right? Um, what do you say to those critics about you know, what goes into it and why we should care about that? You really want me to answer that? Oh, both. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to I'll start going. <laughs> I know. It's... Uh, okay, my spiel is food is undervalued in general in the United States in, 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 a, in a diseased way. And uh, the, the whole model with which we consider what we should be spending on our food is broken and causing us to be sick as a nation, as a world. Um, we make a lot of food and we throw a lot of it away and we sell it for really cheap and we undervalue the food that we're serving and we lose our traditions and we underpay the people who are making it and it's a disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and I have nothing positive to say about the situation. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, the re one of the reasons why we fight hard to do what we do is because I believe in, at least in my years here, is like trying to do something that I believe in and feel right, up, right by, but I mean, we don't, we don't, no one does well who buys <coughs> nice things in restaurants. Um, and it's really hard to make it. Um, and the cost of, you know, I, I had a restaurant, a neighborhood restaurant come and borrow eggs from me on Sunday because it was busy and they wanted to borrow eggs. And, you know, we mm. spend $50, $60 a case of eggs on a case of eggs is what we spend on our eggs that come from a local farm. And we're, you know, like good neighbors, like they're going to come and borrow the eggs from us, and of course, and take whatever eggs you need. And then the next day he's like, oh, I'll hook you up, I'll bring the eggs back and brings back the commodity eggs that are like 12 or $13 a case. So like, we're not going to use them, you know, but I don't want to make them feel bad and be like, oh, you know, we're the ones that are doing things right. But that shows you, we're talking about like mm -hmm. three times the price, mm -hmm. right? And like, you know, a two, you know, a plate of two eggs for breakfast at Lula is not three times the price it is at our competitors. It's a couple of dollars more, yes, mm -hmm. but that mm -hmm. doesn't go anywhere near the length that it needs to go to actually pay for the quality ingredients that we're buying. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, you know, um, I could go on and on about mm -hmm. this, but um, yeah, it's, no. and, it's and vastly undervalued. People want to go eat, out to eat all the time. They want to spend, you know, they want, like, look at $1 oysters. Should anybody be eating, I'm sorry if you guys really like $1 oysters. <laughs> But like oysters right. should not be one dollar. Right. Um, right. Yeah. They are beautiful, like perfect right. pieces of, you know, yeah. uh, protein flown across the world for you to enjoy a la minute, like at the best possible moment. They mm -hmm. shouldn't be a dollar, mm -hmm. and you shouldn't be eating thirty of them. Like that's just not. <laughs> that's not good. So I, this is where like I could go right. on about it, but I feel like it, there's a problem. Yeah. Right. I guess I would add to you for us, um, and I know this is true because we talked about this before for your restaurant, but um, when you're getting, uh, well, let me put it this way, mo most larger breweries, um, when they add some kind of flavoring to a beer, um, very often it's just a flavoring extract, mm -hmm. or they get um, a, you know, some kind of fruit puree in a prepackaged pasteurized container that they just rip the top off of and dump it into a fermenter. Mm -hmm. um, when we add fruit to a beer, we have literally gone into our woods, picked the persimmons or pawpaws, let's say. Um, Aaron, and, Aaron and Chris, one of our farmers, uh, they just went out and did both of those things this fall. They came back. So, does everybody know what pawpaws are? Papas are the largest North American fruit. They're, they're amazing. Like the mango of the Midwest. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah I just, they are. We just had one, so they're one of the few exotic. They taste kind of like yeah, yeah. mango and banana. Right, exactly. And, yeah, like a really like ripe pear. Custard you know? on yeah. the inside. So, and like impossible, but anyway, so you went and go so pick in the pawpaws. You go, phrase, you yeah. go yeah, mm -hmm. to your pawpaw patch, which is deep in the middle of the woods. Mm -hmm. It's the middle of the summer. It's 100 degrees. You come out covered in ticks. No, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have a hundred pounds of these buckets of pawpaws. Then you cut them up and you kind of mash out the pulp. And then you either brew with it straight away or we, we happen to freeze it so we could use it later. That is like an unimaginable amount of work that 
Nope, nobody does. I mean, and that's why that beer might be more expensive than another beer. And it's yeah. still underpriced by yeah. five times what <laughs> right. it should be right. priced at. Yeah, neither experience, you know, at um, having scratch beer or dining at Lula is like one of these once in a lifetime, you know, we'll maybe eat there or have this, you know, bottle of whatever, or have this meal once in our lives. They are both affordable experiences for mm -hmm. most people. So um, I certainly hope that nothing I've said have discouraged no, you. No, not from at all. Work. Keep going. <laughs> Just. I was going to say is that we're going to have a couple of minutes um, and then we're going to uh, open up to Q&A. Um, I wanted to actually mention too that your new book just came out, um, the Scratch Brewing book which uh, was on your, uh, was, which was on your website, um, uh, Goat Approved. Uh, what's with the goats? Uh, <laughs> we have goats. They're right. extremely... Like you know what I'm about to do. They are, uh, <laughs> they're basically our mascot. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, um, it's very expensive to put in the kind of equipment that you need for dairy processing. So at the moment, they're just our good little friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I had asked Jason earlier, just in case I had missed something or maybe there's something in the works, I told Still you I had to ask. Um, so many of the Humanities Festival speakers have new books out. And I was like, oh, how about a Lula book? Yeah, some days. <laughs> <laughs> in your spare need time. to get there, yeah. <laughs> But it, it is, of course, you know, you were saying, so some of the challenges of doing a Lulu book, not the least of which is the time and work, but with how do you document all of the dishes that you do? Yeah, I mean, we don't, we, we do write recipes. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we weigh, weigh things out and write them. Um, but I mean, the, the, the challenge is more just like, what would it be about, you know? Um, because we do a lot of different types of things. Mm -hmm. But um, it's gonna, it will happen at some point. It is? It really? I, I will. Think? I mean, I used to, I, I like, writing, I still write some, mm -hmm. and um, I, I definitely will find the space and, and inspiration to do it at some point. Okay, alrighty. Um, so we are going to open up to Q&A, and we have a question right here, please. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, one moment. We're going to bring a microphone around because we're actually recording and you'll need this. And you'll need to speak into the microphone, the recording. Oh, yeah. In, into the microphone. So what is the the line between fast food and slow food is it you know a sit-down restaurant is it better quality products you know wh where's the line I, you know uh, i know what mcdonald we know what mcdonald's is i mean uh, um the uh, the other day i was in the airport and i noticed that mcdonald's is basically has the same marketing that i do they're like farm fresh eggs and i'm like well, that's what i'm saying uh so the line is clearly blurred <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, I think that it's um, the old lines, uh, we need to draw some new lines maybe. Um, certainly there's a lot of great fast casual stuff that's happening that's uh, more responsible, okay. for sure. I mean, Chipotle has definitely um, opened up people's imaginations for that and now there are uh, business plans coming out, uh, you know, uh, every day that are very inspiring. Um, there's like local burger in uh, California. That, that there's yeah. so many of them that are really um, great. So I think that it's not just about um, the fast casual versus the sit down thing, because I think that there are fast casual restaurants that are definitely paying attention in the way that I'm talking about. And I definitely think it's the, the conscientious, like why, you know, think about that word conscious, like connection to food and, and cooking that uh, will make those places slow even if you get your food quickly. So Local Burger that Jason mentioned is a, a food truck chef and a, a fine dining chef who came together who are trying to bring um, burgers and other fast food with like less of a, a carbon footprint yeah. like for most of the meat. Super and, cool. Yeah. And McDonald's has a Royale with cheese so they're copying totally. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think in terms of the difference between slow food? Slow yeah drink? and I would also say I don't know what you think about this from the food side but um, you know that, you, that you're really as a, a business owner or, or um, you know, beer maker or uh, food maker that you're really trying to support um, local agriculture, uh, regional agriculture, um, local farmers, um, you know, uh, conscientiousness about where you're sourcing ingredients from too. Yeah, the, the idea of, of a fast food restaurant or, or a slow food restaurant, maybe, maybe slow is even the wrong word these days. I don't know, yeah. yeah. We have a question right over here. Oh, sorry, go ahead. 
Where do you think uh, Big and Little restaurant falls in? What restaurant? Big and Little. Big and Little? I, I, I mean, I don't really know enough to You're too busy, on. actually. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Big and Little's is uh, a restaurant. Um, the chefs were on a TV competition show one, have like three locations now, and um, um, are I've never known been for sandwiches. Enough, yeah. yeah, so, um, but, um, but yeah, so, but yeah, so um, what do you think about, like, do, I cannot, and I know that you have multiple layered menus for at Lula, for mm -hmm. example. Um, uh, I would think maybe your closest would be sort of like your breakfast burrito? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so. And was that something, when did that start? Was that an evolution or was that always No, we've always like, had that. We've always had the I mean, we took over an existing cafe that had, that, that had breakfast burritos on the menu. So we just kept it going. <laughs> <laughs> wow. We didn't know much when we started. Thank goodness it was good. <laughs> and another question over here. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about the sort of business side of things. I mean, on the one hand, you have the ideals of slow food and locally sourced, and on the other hand, you have to make a living, and there's so much competition. There's a lot of craft breweries, a lot of restaurants. I mean, it's pretty impressive you've been open since 99. That's a long time. I mean, it's super stressy, I'll tell you that. It's, not, <laughs> it's just as stressful right now as it was the day that we opened up, because it had, like, the economic picture hasn't gotten better. I mean, we're really busy and we're big, you know, so um, we can manage, um, but it's something that we think about constantly. And like me, I'm just like walking around, like trying to make sure that nobody wastes anything, you know, um, and that's like the, the conscious, like the focus that we have on, uh, on the business side, but it's, uh, it's the restaurant business, like everybody says, it's like not for the faint of heart, and it's really because it's not easy to make money. It's really difficult. Um, if you are going to make the right choices like that, it's extremely difficult. So, um, I mean, I still, uh, today was the first day that I've been, you know, I uh, was at home in, you know, at least 60 days. Um, oh, man. At least two months. Um, and... So, I mean, it's still after 17 years something that you have to be constantly focused on and your chefs do as well. And, you know, if you don't have a vision for your team, you're, you're totally, you're in a lot of trouble um, for my kind of restaurant. And there are a lot of really, I mean, the great thing is that at this time, like, you know, in a few minutes, Abraham is going to, and Adrian will be here, right? And they're really good friends of mine. I was sitting with Adrian, uh, Abraham last night. Um, and we talk about this constantly, you know, like, how do you make it? Like, what, you know, what? new ideas do we have for um, changing our models like and then we have the you know the other things like offering health insurance and changing like salaries to, to match new salary needs and also just motivating people to stay with us for a long time um, and those are the things that we talk about yeah Abraham and I don't talk about food we talk about <laughs> the business and um, you know uh, that's the, the challenge and he I know he's just as like you know, focused and energetic about like making sure he's on top of things as I am. And that's true of every small good restaurant in the city, whether it's, you know, I can name a, you know, Parachute and Avondale, I can name a hundred of them. Like mm -hmm. the city is full of like young, uh, self-driven chefs um, doing great stuff. Um, so, and they're present, very, very present all the mm -hmm. time. Yeah, um, and then, I mean, on the craft beer side, the marketplace is just changing. It's jammed absolutely rapidly I mean before our eyes practically every month it seems like um, you know shelf space is absolutely at a premium right now um, it's really hard for people to break into the market and then on top of that you have breweries that are growing rapidly too um, that maybe started smaller and now they're a lot bigger and they're producing a whole lot more and that's kind of invading shelf space it's also allowing them to um, create the same product but more cheaply and so in some ways it ends up kind of undercutting you know a beer like ours which suddenly ends up on a shelf next to that beer that say was twenty dollars and now it's twelve and all of a sudden we have this one over here that's twenty five and this one's already tried and true somebody knows what this is going to taste like picking it up and this one has mushrooms in it 
like, I'm not going to spend $25 on a mushroom. I don't know what it's going to taste like. It's going to taste like mushrooms. How do I, how do, I know I like mushrooms? It might right. be that I probably don't. Um, so that's definitely a challenge. And, um, you know, we're, we're definitely, we're a young business. Um, and we're, we're still trying to work out a lot of um, how our growth is going to go, how big we want to be, um, staying true to our <coughs> philosophy and our ethic. Um, and we've been fortunate, I think, because we have such a unique kind of business and very unique flavors that people have really gravitated to what we've been doing. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. And we can come up to a place like Chicago and be welcomed with open arms to some of the craft beer nerd joints. Um, and that's been awesome. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, there's always a fear, I guess, of, um, of losing that. Another thing I would say too is there are a lot of breweries that are making sour beers um, just to kind of you know play on this the slow the slow beer side that are that take a very long time to age in barrels. I mean they will sit for one to three years and there there are a handful of breweries that are just starting to create these beers that take a long time. They age for a long time and they will also go up on a shelf and compete with another beer that had a very rapid souring process and there are some people in the industry that are trying to create actually some kind of logo or identification that would show people hey this beer has been sitting for three years developing complex flavors and aromas you know what you're getting when you spend a little bit more on this beer versus this other one um, yeah there's there's so much change in the marketplace though it's uh, it's tricky for sure so we have time for one more question, and before that I just wanted to remind everybody that Marika will be signing books in the room next to that, and then we'll also have a talk back in the room following if you'd like to continue on talking about these ideas. Thank you. Hi, I was wondering if you could speak to um, the type of work and the types of things you're doing, do you see yourselves as incubators at all? Do you work at all with other collaborators in slow food movements or in other movements of foraging or farm to table or things like that? Like, could you just speak a little bit about any kind of future you see for these things and how it might manifest itself in like our everyday lives as opposed to just fine dining and um, fancy beers? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, we don't have a slow food movement where we are in Southern Illinois, but um, I'm on the board of a nonprofit that um, supports sustainable agriculture and food systems in our area. Um, that almost more than anything for me is a driving principle of our business is supporting local farms and farmers, local agriculture. Um, just this, this year in January we hired two farmers to come and work with us. Um, I really truly believe that as a business owner you make decisions every single day about what you want your business to be. Um, how you want it to play a role in your community and every single thing that you do, every tiny decision that you make um, affects, has a ripple effect. Um, you know, we could have bought, I don't know, $40,000 worth of fermenters. Instead, we decided to hire two farmers. And uh, I think if that's a model for other people, I'm happy to be the uh, canary in the coal mine. In terms of uh, I mean, I feel like we have some strong partnerships with people that are growing um, for us, and we have a like we have our own gardener, for example. That we like we built a garden on our roof, and we have a gardener who has a plot of land that we sort of contract grow with her on specific things. So those are that's sort of an incubator relationship, I guess, because uh, we're trying to see what she can, how that. I mean, because, I mean, the farmers are obviously just as, I mean, or worse in terms of a financial model than uh, restaurants and, and breweries that, that they struggle too. So, like, th there's got to be a way of lifting both of those um, boats up. Um, so I do see those as incub incubator relationships, and we have as much to learn from trying something new with them as, uh, as they do from working with us. Um, I mean, that said, the other thing I would say is that I spend a lot of time uh, working on a not-for-profit called Pilot Light that a, a couple of chefs have developed, and we're working on trying to get um, curriculum into CPS that's um, about exactly what we've been talking about, sort of like looking at the world through 
the lens of, uh, of food and interconnecting um, relationships with food and uh, in your everyday world and making that a conscious thing in, in classrooms. So I do feel like um, chefs and brewers and others in the food world have a lot, uh, uh, there's a lot of potential in working with the education system and also with school lunch. So I mean those are, I mean I don't know if that's really answering your question, but that's an area where I see is like um, doing something outside of the restaurant, you know what I mean? Um, but I spend, you know, a, a lot of time doing. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that um, uh, while one could consider um, Lula fine dining and scratch fancy beer, um, that uh, their experiences, like I said, that you could, we could go and get a glass of scratch for under 10 bucks for sure in Chicago, and you could get a meal. We have, yeah, up and down. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and you could get a meal, you could get like that breakfast burrito, which mm -hmm. is amazing. And those eggs that go into it, I can't remember, it's under 10 bucks, you mm -hmm. know? I mean, so understanding the time and the effort and the care um, and the conscientiousness that goes into it, I think that having a chance to go in and interacting and talking, because you're, when you're there, you're there, and going down to Ava, Illinois, five hours drive southwest, I think that is, you know, we can all take responsibility and go and engage and support um, the food and drink that we want to see continue and happen, uh, not only in Chicago, but this But, but, this but it's world. true that, I mean, if you want any kind of systemic change, like it needs to be outside of any particular industry. So I do think that restaurants and other food businesses do need to um, connect in a ways that will transform their models and mm -hmm. help each other. Um, especially from the, the agriculture side, um, there are some new models where, you know, instead of just chefs buying whatever is available at a farmer's market or on a, a farmer's list, where farmers will actually, like, contract grow for their, for their menus. Like, that's something that we've always tried to do and it hasn't exactly worked, but there's some new ideas mm -hmm. that are coming out that I hopefully will, will change. And uh, just recently, uh, a new company started doing that with fish, where they would just mm -hmm. send you, like, 30 pounds of whatever is at its best and most sustainable, rather mm -hmm. than you being like, I want 10 pounds of salmon and five pounds of halibut, right. um, and no matter what the ocean is giving us. So mm -hmm. like there are changes in the, in the yeah. models that I think are, um, need to come from us looking outside of our particular spheres. Yep, Communi CSF, Community Supported Fisheries, which is uh, the next step for Midwestern. It's a, it's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, those are happening. Um, so again, uh, we want to thank so much Marka Josephson <laughs> and Jason Hamill uh, for joining us this evening for Slow Food Talk at Chicago Humanities Festival. Thank you all again so much. Thank you.